Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the Director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation, now in virtual mode. We're looking at the same sorts of issues as we were looking at in the real world. And obviously, sustainability, particularly financial sustainability, is very close to our hearts. Uh, we've done a lot of work on it. Some of you may see the videos that we've done with Ben Caldicott at the Oxford Smith School. But we've been looking at uh, various issues relating to ESG and the pandemic. And this particular panel is to look beyond the pandemic. Uh, ESG, that's environmental, social and governance priorities beyond the pandemic. And I'm delighted that we have three very eminent speakers. We have Leon Cami from uh, Federated Hermes, who is the head of responsibility there, an executive director there. He joined uh, what was then Hermes in 2002, I think, from Marconi Systems, and before that was at Deloitte, educated at the London School of Economics. Catherine Howarth is the, the uh, CEO of Share Action, which she joined in 2008. She's a board member of the Scott Trust, owner of The Guardian. Uh, she serves on the Treasury's Asset Management Task Force, educated at Oxford and LSE. Jonas Ruser is uh, the, at, uh, the head of sustainability at Bloomberg's New, e New Energy Finance Group. Uh, he's, been there, he's been at Bloomberg for nine years. Uh, he's a, a racing cyclist and a vegetarian, so you kind of know his, uh, his priorities. He's educated at Cambridge and Imperial. I give you, however, my colleague Jane Fuller was educated at Cambridge. This is a very narrow group. Um, this is what's called assortative mating, I think. Uh, your, your questions that you've, you've sent off to the panel, Jane, just set a, an agenda for yeah. us. Jane Fuller. So just to clear, um, ESG priorities beyond the pandemic um, begs the question, priorities for whom? And um, obviously bearing in mind that the, the panel, it's uh, for investors. But of course, investors um, are engaging with companies or indeed excluding them from portfolios. So it's for investors, but very much thinking about their impact on uh, corporate behaviour. Um, any discussion of ESG priorities beyond COVID-19, I'm afraid, can't escape. Some discussion of COVID-19 and what impact it's had on, whether it's e the environment, uh, social issues, uh, uh, governance issues. So we will have a, some of that. But um, we do also really want to lift our heads and think, well, if there is going to, when we have a new normal, uh, on the other side of the pandemic, um, what will have changed in terms of ESG priorities and what uh, role will investor groups um, and others with strong influence on corporate boards have had on that? OK, Leon, your, your thoughts, first of all, from, particularly from the point of view of Federated Homies. Um, so, so clearly the pandemic itself um, in terms of outcomes, has been very bad. Um, unfortunately, there's been a huge human cost um, in, in terms of people um, uh, passing. Um, there's been a huge cost in terms of the economy. Um, there's been a lot of uh, redundancies. Um, and so overall, the outcomes has been, hasn't, been, hasn't been great for society. But in the midst of that, we have seen some really good behaviors. Um, um, many, many companies have really thought about um, how they were going to keep their employees and try and ride um, the clear cash flow shortages and the like to, to maintain, to keep their employees so they can come out the other side. There's been an amazing focus on well being um, as well in many companies, obviously, not all companies, and that's all, all been positive. I think. Environmentally, um, uh, we've been forced to, to travel less, uh, certainly by, by plane, and so that must be positive for carbon emissions. Um, though whenever I've had to drive in town, I have found it really difficult to get through. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sure a number of people are, are ditching the train and, and, and using the car to try and keep safe. So, so I'm sure environmentally through the crisis, it's, it's, it's a sort of a mixed bag. On the governance side, I would say that companies and boards have been forced to think about all their different stakeholders in a way which they haven't done before. And in the UK um, company law, there is something called Section 172, which does focus um, board directors on 
the success of the company, but does say that one needs to think about different stakeholders. And I think for the first, for the first time, all companies are really forced to think about stakeholders. And I think that if, if we can really leverage that, that's going to be good, good for the future. Because we've got a number of disruptions coming, coming our way. Um, the climate disruption um, is certainly on its way. Um, technology disruption is on its way. Both of those are going to have significant implications for the welfare of society and the investors which, which are in it. Um, who knows what could happen in terms of inequality? And so going forwards, this focus on stakeholders should be good so that, so that companies can try and address those sorts of issues when it, when it thinks about um, what the future um, should, should look like. So um, I'm sure we're going to get into this more. I'm going to stop there. Okay. All right. Well, let, let, me, let me ask uh, Catherine how pick up on some of the themes that uh, Leon's just uh, brought out. Hello, everyone. Great to be part of this conversation. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I won't add to what Leon has said about the actual effect of this pandemic on, on people's real lives. It's, it's quite clearly horrific. And even for those not directly touched, I think the, the level of stress and impact on mental health is, is, is something that we'll probably only see over time um, the toll that that's taking. But just in, in terms of the investment industry, um, it has apparently been a period of sort of record inflows into ESG branded funds. And um, early on in the pandemic, there was a there was a story that um, you know ESG related funds were outperforming and had you know done well, and there was obviously a, a, an early crash. And then there's been a massive pickup um, fueled by monetary um, policy response on on a ginormous scale. Um, and of course, that sort of sets things up where who knows where the chickens will eventually come back to roost in, in terms of some of those dynamics, but. Yes, so there's been this kind of very strong pickup in in ESG fund flow, and I would say that the commit the focus on climate action has apparently not slowed. I thought that that might be completely knocked off course by the focus uh, on um, on on health um, as a result of the pandemic, but it seems apparently not. Having said that, when you sort of scrape away, um, there's been a lot of talk about green recovery and um, and green public finance. And actually, when you look at the numbers, maybe Jonas will have more detail on this. It's, it's actually very much more rhetorical um, than anything else. And talking of rhetoric, there's a really fascinating piece of work done focusing on American companies, um, a piece of work called The Test of Corporate Purpose that had a look at how companies were responding in the pandemic who had signed the business roundtable statement on corporate purpose, which was a very high profile sort of bit of um, uh, of kind of branding and puffery by the corporate sector in America late last year. And the, the evidence is that the companies that had signed the business roundtable statement on corporate purpose had not actually performed better in terms of their response to the pandemic, thinking of stakeholder interests than any other companies in the wider economy. And in fact, the companies that were really doing well by their stakeholders um, and behaving in a responsible way and thinking about sort of resilience um, in the community, in the wider community, in the way they responded, were really those that already had a serious track record, many of them actually keeping quite quiet about it. Um, so, so I think th there's, there's a lot um, where we really sort of need to dig under the surface. And, and that's been true for a long period that there's been a lot of rhetoric, both in the investment community and in the business community about stakeholder capitalism. And it really does need quite sort of detailed examination. But the reason that, 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 that those statements are being made is that there is a strong sense underlying, I think, in, in, the, in the consumer base among citizens and ordinary savers, that they're extremely interested in having their retirement savings invested in a more sustainable way. And I, I don't think that's a trend that will go away. And in fact, I think the, the pandemic will probably um, only strengthen um, the desire to see 
companies and their investors thinking about um, resilience. And we will see new trends and themes. So I think the focus on the workforce, again, although I think a lot of it is a bit shallow and there's more rhetoric than reality to a lot of this, but I do think the focus on the workforce will probably be um, a shift that comes out of the pandemic in terms of ESG, where it's been very dominated by the climate discussion, critical as that is. And then I think another trend is that we will see much more focus on public health, that the pandemic has exposed um, enormous health inequalities and differential vulnerability to, to COVID, which are actually symptoms of, of, of you know, deep underlying health inequalities that, that companies are well positioned to, to address. And so I think that will become much more central in the ESG story in, in the future. So, I mean, those are some, some opening thoughts from me that um, I, I guess the, bit, the big story is we, we need to look very, very closely um, at, at the gap between walk and talk, both in the corporate community and in the investment sector. I do want to bring Jane in, but let me just ask you one question here. I mean, at the present time, the overwhelming problem is unemployment, is it not? We are losing millions of jobs. I mean, millions over, over the world. You know, something like one third of the of the labour force is either unemployed or about to become unemployed. How is there a moral issue here? How how high should we put environmental issues or governance issues, for that matter, when the overwhelming need is to get people back to work? What does a, what what does somebody like Share Action? How does Share Action view that? Well, we do think it's. Um... A mistake to try and sort of pit um, environmental performance against um, social responsibilities of companies and investors. Um, not least because if we do, you know, ahead um, and continue on our path to, you know, devastating global warming, that, you know, and there's some very good uh, um, cartoons in The Economist early in the pandemic, which sort of illustrated just how much more devastating kind of some of the impacts of climate change could be on migration and on labor markets and on and on people than even this pandemic has been so far but i but i completely concur that we are in a um unemployment crisis and actually i think we're only really at the at the start of it because you know so far in the uk at least we've been very much propped up by furlough and um and and that is not going to be the case sort of indefinitely although although there are calls for that now and martin wolf this week in the ft was saying you know, we're just going to have to keep this going because the social implications of not doing so um are so severe um but, but I know people start to get uneasy about the scale of, of public debts that we're racking up to look after people. And, and, I, and, I, and I think just as we have public financing supporting people, there are really important questions for companies about um, how they prioritise looking after people. Um, and, and some sharp questions have been asked of companies that were, that were issuing dividends when they were also, they had received public backing and public financing, we're issuing dividends and making large parts of the workforce unemployed. So it's so important that we have scrutiny at this time. Um, but, but to be fair to the corporate sector, no one company, you know, we're in a systemically very challenging moment. These are macro trends and no company can, can completely insulate itself um, and do its best by its people whilst remaining resilient and a going concern. If that the, you know, there just isn't a market for the products anymore. But let me go back to to Leon on this S social social impact. Unemployment is the a major social impact. Does that mean that at least over the short term, S as it were dominates at E and G, or ought to? And so I, I see G as as very just very. I mean, it's G in a sense um, dominates E and S. And that G applies to E and S. All, all governance is, is about trying to make sure everyone in the investment chain is working for the investor and the investor makes up society. So, so governance, in a sense, um, uh, works with both E and S. Um, I agree with Catherine. I, um, I don't think there has to be a trade off between um, what we're doing for employees um, and, and what we're thinking about or longer term, not that long term, quite honestly, on, on the environment. Um, and, and in some ways, the best time to, 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 to achieve change can be in a crisis. I mean, one thing the crisis has taught us is um, 
how much drastic action you can take if you put your mind to it. I mean, early on in the early part of the lockdown, there were significant actions which companies and governments would never have dreamt of um, at the time. So, so rather than necessarily being in opposition, I think one can one can uh, uh, try and, and look. It's not going to be easy to deal with the short term. Um, the challenges which we face, companies have faced over the last six months, are just going to intensify over the next six months. And we have no less uncertainty than we had six months ago. I mean, if we were in March, we thought by September, we'll know where we're going. But we don't really. It, it, the uncertainty has got worse, if anything. Um, so there's going to be challenging times, but that doesn't mean one can't plan for a long-term future. And the long-term future has to address climate disruption and also has to address, address what disruption is coming our way from a technology point of view, because that's going to have significant implications for the number of people we employ, the sorts of skills um, we look, we're looking for, the types, the quality of those jobs. Um, so we, we, can't, we can't ignore that. Right. I, just, I suppose I have a prejudice. Uh, I, at the moment, my feeling is the quantity of jobs rather than the quality of jobs. I do think that the number of people unemployed has massive social and indeed health consequences. Jane, do you want to add anything to that or should we pass on to, to Jonas? Just, um, I think that um, we do have to focus on the trade-offs. That if you, even if you think about a company like uh, Boohoo, which uh, you know is um, black marks on the governance side, as well as on um, the treatment of um, its labour force and failure to monitor the supply chain, which is, I think, an, an important aspect of this. Um, however, if people are, if, if its customers are stretched, then they will be still be pleased to buy clothing. At costing less than ten pounds, so I th I think it's one has to be, it's it that some of the trade offs are real, and the other thing is, and perhaps um, Jonas will come to come onto this that I I'm there has been an impact on investments, um, companies are having to cut costs, um, so is this impeding the sort of investment needed to green the economy to build back better, um, and to the extent that they are investing, as Leon has just raised, are they investing? in kit that will um, automate jobs and therefore not be good for employment. So Jonas. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I, as head of sustainability research at, at BNF, I'm looking, we're looking a lot at sort of the trends from, um, for, uh, for the, from the perspective of how can we help companies become more sustainable what, and what is happening you know, in, in, in their world. And so a lot of what we've been doing throughout the pandemic has been tracking some of the indicators to, to try and figure out you know, where what are the pressures and 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 in particular in we when we started that exercise we were trying to answer the question you know is this going to prove that sustainability is a nice to have for the good times rather mm -hmm. than a must have at all times mm -hmm. and it very much seems to be the latter um so we've been tracking indicators including you know, clean energy buying by companies which is is uh, on on track to exceed 2019 levels um voluntary off carbon offsetting is the same Again, you know, we're, we're, we're almost at 2019 levels at this point. Um, there was a point about uh, uh, record um, inflows into ESG funds, and that's definitely the case. We've been, we've been tracking those, and we've seen, um, uh, let me see, in September, we had um, $5 billion, um, $5 billion flow into ESG ETFs specifically, um, which, you know, before the pandemic and, and into, you know, in the 2018, 2019, that was uh, one, one billion, two billion sort of level, and and it, and it sort of shot up consistently above four billion uh, since the pandemic hit. Um, the same around um, uh, sustainable debt, we've been which we've been tracking. Um, sustainable debt issuance, you know, green bonds are are again exceeding uh, 2019, you know, levels for, for September. Um, so so you, sort of year to date, and and obviously everything to do with social has really. Um, has really exploded on the on the debt side, and what's been really interesting there is that you know there was this this emergence of a new category of of debt, you know, pandemic finance, um, which was relatively meaningless to be honest. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of it, uh, but a lot of it was essentially just bonds that mentioned pandemic and fighting the pandemic without really any of the safeguards that uh, are required for for, for legitimate sort of sustainable debt. But what also happened was that social bond issuance. 
started to really pick up. And social bonds and insurance in 2019 came to about 20 billion. Um, we hit 20 billion in April for, um, uh, for for social bonds, and it's really exploded since then. And we're we're, we're sort of over over 70 billion at this point. And what's been really interesting is that um, pandemic finance has slowed down, has co- almost come to a halt, and the proportion of of social bonds that are also pandemic related has declined as well. And so what what we're seeing is that you know, social bond social bond issuance is becoming a trend in its own right. It's not just driven by this temporary need. It's really, you know, this acceptance and understanding of social resiliency has, has kind of really come through as a as a sort of almost as a side effect, it seems, of 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 the the, the increased awareness due to the pandemic. Um, it, the I mean, and around commitments as well. So um, the the number of TCFD supporters for 2020 has already outstripped the total for 2019. Yeah, I think sorry, and, um, TCFD. That's um, the task um, the task force for, task force, task force for disclosures, which um, if financial institutions are going to these disclosures, they're going to have to make these. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, exactly. And and. We're also on track for a record year in terms of the number of companies with science-based targets, which means companies that have set climate emission targets um, that are verified to be in line with, you know, two, well below two degrees or 1.5 degrees of global warming. You know, not just companies claiming net zero, but companies actually going through the process of getting that confirmed as you know, legitimate uh, within within that right, and then. Sort of, you know, the original questions were around looking forward, and and that, you know, that's something I want to. We we've also been thinking about, and in particular, we um, we ran a survey of uh, sustainability professionals in in various different companies, looking at the impact on their um, on different aspects of their practice, like during the pandemic uh, or during the the worst of the lockdown, and then asking them what might happen in the future as well. And what was very interesting was. Um, a few things. One of them was obviously every, everything was down um, during the pandemic, pretty much. So, uh, decarbonization activity, supply chain engagement, ambition around their strategy, executive access was was a serious limiting factor because obviously there was firefighting going on, budgets. Um, but investor perception was up, uh, meaning that you know investor pressure to engage with sustainability was was increased during the pandemic, and then. Going into sort of the post lockdown, you know, what were they expecting going forward? They were actually expecting pretty much everything across the board to be up, uh, investor perception obviously to go to to, to increase and, and and be positively affected as a result of the crisis. Um, it, same around decarbonization activity, supply chain engagement, ambition, executive access. They were essentially saying our jobs are going to be become more important, and and this is going to become more of a priority for my company as a result of the pandemic. But the sort of reality check is obviously budgets are down. Budgets are down significantly during the pandemic, and they're still expecting budgets to be down afterwards. Um, That's yeah. really important. I mean, there is there seems to be a gap. I mean, the picture you were painting was of increased involvement, optimism that uh, ESG criteria would be built into the system in a much mm-hmm. more effective way than it has been so far. But then, as you say, budgets are being cut. Who wins, budget, budgets, uh, or aspiration? Yeah. yeah, I think I think you're going to get. I think that you already have a two-speed system in this. I think that you have the leading companies that are able to keep going, and then you have you know the struggling companies and the smaller companies as well, who you know, for whom this is a lot a lot more challenging. So I, I suspect that what we're going to keep seeing is we're going to keep seeing a lot of the metrics that I mentioned essentially track. The leading behaviors they don't track. They don't really track the laggards, right? And, and so I think what we're going to see is those laggards are the ones who are really going to be, be harder to push along and to get and to bring along. And and you know, my view is always that that's really where the role of government and the role of regulation is. You know, the leaders show the way, and then once it's proven that you can go in a certain direction, then everybody else has to get pushed to go there. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, my my expectation is that there will be continu- there will be a continuation of this sort of two speed where the the real hallmark companies uh, are, are are strongly leading and then and then the rest will 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 fall behind. Does that resonate with either of you, Catherine, Leon? 
It does. It does actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I just looked at some ch- charts. I mean, just taking financial performance alone, um, the, the the U.S. stock market performance is essentially a story about six companies that have done incredibly well, and the rest of the U.S. economy is in the doldrums. And and I think you sort of see the same in the ESG landscape. Like, there's a small number of high profile, you know firms and their stories fill the pages of the FT and Bloomberg um, articles um, where they're making kind of, you know, really impressive commitments. And then there's everyone else who's been, you know, walloped financially by by the pandemic and where it becomes a much more serious test of um, their, you know, deep commitment or otherwise to, to ESG to stakeholder priorities to kind of maintain the story um, when when times are so tough. So this is kind of going back to my earlier point about how you really need to look under um, and scrape away at the detail to to kind of get the the real picture because there's an awful lot of, um, and you know, the investment industry as a whole is keen to tell this story about how you know responsible it is these days, and 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 that that's certainly true. And there are some brilliant firms, by the way. Leon's firm is kind of pretty much the market leader around all of this. Um, but um, it's not true. It's not true for everyone. And 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 that now, we just talked about the role of regulation, and um, there has been some really very important regulation coming in in the in the UK pension fund sector. Um, over the last couple of years, and now come now pension firms are having to provide these so-called implementation statements, which are kind of a requirement to be transparent about how they're tackling ESG risks and what they're doing on the stewardship of companies in their portfolios. And um, again, that's that's going to be re- really interesting to see. Um, we, you know, it's too early really because the, the implementation statements have only just been a kind of live requirement. But to, to kind of really have a little look at, at how different pension funds in practice are, are grappling with this will be will be quite instructive. Okay, there are a couple of couple of issues there, Leon. First of all, deep deep commitments need deep pockets. That seems to be what uh, what what Catherine is saying, and perhaps also Jonas. And then the other, the the changes in legislation here or regulation here. So, I mean, so in, in response, I, I I would say I'm quite worried at the moment about what the next six to twelve months are going to bring. And, and I feel the markets are um, are looking too good. I mean, I'm not providing any investment advice. I'm just, as a layperson, I would suggest they look very, very good. Yesterday, I um, came across uh, one of the sell-side analysts' uh, uh, reports, um, which just looked in the US at, so I think, 12 months performance or so um, across different industries. And... Two thirds of the bars were above the line. One third were below the line. So you'd expect airlines to be below the line. Um, energy was below the line. Um, uh, what else? There was um, there were certain types of, of, of retail below home improvements. You had online retail. Um, all that was a Above, above the line and quite quite handsomely. And, and I, I, we all know that the underlying performance of companies has, has gone down. The budgets are, are lower. The level of GDP has dropped. This is all going to have implica- significant implications. So that, that I'm really concerned about. Don't know exactly how, how that's going to pan out. But we've got to be careful not to get too excited by, by what's in the markets. More positively, I came across yesterday a um, a report which just was launched yesterday called the Return on Purpose, um, and it looked at the re- I think returns over probably over five years, um, and they use a certain approach to say who, who who has a high purpose brand and who has a low purpose brand, and it was quite staggering some of the the returns. So over a long period of time, return on invested capital for the high purpose thirteen percent. Low purpose, 7%. Total shareholder return, high purpose, 25% per annum. Low purpose, 5% per annum. And then they looked at it over the COVID period. And and they saw those for high purpose did did better in in COVID. 
again, that's a mar- the market saying that, so people are following what, uh, what what might be happening there. But that might be that might be more positive. Jane, do you have do you have any thoughts on on what you've heard from the three of them? Um, well, yes, I think that um, what, one thing which perhaps we should now discuss is that. Um, that there, there are some some good signs in terms of performance. I think one has to be careful about this because, um, and Leon was alluding to some of the sector changes that actually, um, uh, if you weren't in oil for you know most of the past few years, that was actually very helpful. Um, although, of course, with oil coming back off its extreme lows of March, um, you know maybe more more a very recent measure of performance might not be so flattering to to, to E certainly the E and ESG. Um, in terms of the this very small group of um, big tech companies that have mm-hmm. driven US stock market performance, they will tend to do well on E, actually not so well on G because they tend to have dominant uh, uh, personalities leading them. Um, but of course, um, and this goes back to what Andrew was saying earlier, they do, they're big, but they don't actually employ that many people bearing in mind um, you know the level of their sales and, and and their market values. So again, you've got a, a bit of of tension there in terms of how much good do they actually do. But one thing perhaps we could now move on to, um, bearing in mind what's been said about um, it, this regulation that ha- is forcing better disclosure uh, mm-hmm. to the sort of end savers, such as uh, pension fund members, on where their money is going and whether it's going, you know, going to anything dirty or not. Um, how good uh, now is the data? And the metrics for being sure that if something says that it's kosher, uh, environmentally, it really is. Well, the obvious person is Jonas. Um, it's this whole taxonomy issue again that we hear every yeah, time ESG is raised. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that I think that's a lot of that is still working progress. I think that um, you know the. I think that we've moved past the point of just needing more data, thankfully. Uh, and I think that you know companies are hopefully grateful for that as well because they've they've constantly being asked for more different data points uh, because everybody wants to measure things in their own way and and because they don't trust what they're what they're getting. Um, so yeah, I think that we're getting to the point now where it's really about what matters where more materiality you know, really is is the issue. Uh, is the driving driving concern, and that's something that you know, SASB, uh, the Sustainable, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, you know, sort of really pushed on um, with the development of their framework. And now, with the EU taxonomy, is being taken as a whole step further. Um, and I think that I think that is very powerful. It's also you know a lot of the EU taxonomy is also very challenging to measure. And we're, you know in Bloomberg, we're trying to implement. So it, we're building you know products that will allow people to sort of do taxonomy assessments on, of, of companies and it's, it's extremely challenging and it's very you know labor intensive work but it but I think that um, one of the things I've seen here you know sort of uh, um, uh, being a, a sort of semi outside of BNF was acquired by Bloomberg and, and we've, we've kind of kept you know to some extent kept our own culture and we have to some extent our own product that's encouraging to hear that the data is cleaner, Jonas, um, and that there's plenty of it. Um, so you've got this uh, a good pile of uh, raw material. But how about how does that translate into metrics that really genuinely can give reassurance uh, to investors? That, um, yeah. Basically doing what it says yeah. on the ESG. Yeah, just having the data and throwing data at people isn't very useful. I think you need to figure out what, what, why it matters, how it matters. And, you know, that's the layer of, of analysis that we're adding to 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 our work um, through you know through Bloomberg and EF through Bloomberg Intelligence, which is another research department um, in in Bloomberg, and we're creating um, again creating ESG scores of various various kinds. Uh, but the purpose here is really transparency. So I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people confidence in the data by showing how the data connects to the score. So you can track the score all the way down to its constituent. You know issues, and then all of those issues down into sub issues, and then all of those sub issues down into individual data points. And you can go and look at that data and question if it if it, if it's the right data point, if it's correct, and so on. And whether or not you use those scores 
is is secondary to the fact that you're being told this is what math this is what we believe matters. Here is the useful data. Now figure out what, you know if you want to use this, if you want to change it in some way, you know go ahead. And one a project that I've been working on um, most recently and actually very intensively over the last um, nine months has been specifically looking at the topic of transition and how well prepared companies are for transition. And and doing that at an industry specific level. So what what we're working on is how well how well positioned is the business model of an individual company for transition. Looking at the oil industry first. So really looking at you know the risk that the upstream faces, the risk that the downstream faces. How much are they actually doing in renewables? How much are they actually doing in in carbon capture and storage and so on? And some of these things are not disclosed by by the companies themselves. And that's where you know, BNF has a lot of data sets that are sort of, you know, global CCS projects, global renewable projects, and so on that we're using to to add value to to that sort of insight and to give a real granularity of, ins, you know, a, a detailed insight into um, into what's happening at the company level. And again, principle being transparency is key because I think that without transparency, you don't know whether you can trust what you're seeing, and it and it just becomes an opinion. What we're trying to say is, here's our opinion, take it or leave it, but here's the data behind the opinion that's useful for you. And it's useful for you, Catherine. Yeah. Well, what I was just going to say is that I think that the the, the quality of the data disclosed by companies and available by company and available about companies is is better on the E side of ESG, um, but not excellent. And it's very poor on the S side of ESG. So very few companies make meaningful disclosures about their workforce and the and the supply chain workforce that um, feeds into their company. Um, we've been leading a project called the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, backed by a large group of investors to try and actually extract from companies comparable, meaningful, and quite granular information about the workforce. Um, and but it's very early days. And on the whole, what companies provide is a sort of suite of slightly anecdotal and often very self-serving bits and pieces of information about um, how they manage uh, human capital, so-called. And and yet there's an acknowledgement that human capital is actually a very important factor. It is material to companies' long-term success, how well it's managed. Um, so we, we're very far from where we need to be to have the kind of data that would really allow truly ESG integrated investment. And there's a great deal more, you know, discussion about how you know this is happening than, than really the data allows for yet. But um, this is where I do think regulation is important, and the EU is being particularly ambitious. Um, it's got this um, sustainable finance disclosure regulation that's already passed. It's not yet binding um, or, or operational because there's a sort of two-year period where it, where it comes into force. But effectively, investors are going to have to disclose um, how they are managing all these factors. And that will require them to be a lot more demanding of companies in producing comparable information on um, things that go wider than emissions. I mean, c- carbon emissions is, is the area where it's best developed thanks to CDP over many years. But really, there are huge black holes in the data um, and 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 I think we are really in the foothills of where we need to get in order to allow investors properly to factor these in these factors into investment decisions. And what are, what has the has the COVID pandemic done? Has it highlighted the the shortcomings in S rather than E and G, for instance? Well, I think it's it's flagged it's created because of the points you made andrew about um you know the, the the huge vulnerability of millions of working people um to pandemic um uh, impacts economically that it's it's created a huge interest in how companies are treating people the reality is that investors don't have the data on this to kind of make they they, they have bits and pieces of useful information that they can kind of um make best use of but really not systematic comparable data sets and so, really the, um, the, yeah, the so a long way to go. on the e right and the e and the g rather than on the s so far even at the european level is that not true yeah. that is true yes yeah. so the um the, the the taxonomy is an e taxonomy not an e and s taxonomy um, to be fair to the commission officials, their line on this is, look, we're just sort of testing things out and working them through. We have 
in every intention in the long term of making this a more balanced picture. And I hope that the pandemic will accelerate that commitment um, or that, the yeah, let's see. Leon. Um, so I completely agree with Catherine on ENS. I'm not going to repeat anything she said there, completely chime in with what she said there. On, on G, in some ways we have too much information on G. And um, there's just reams and reams of it. And, and working through it is the harder thing because it doesn't always, I, in a sense, I'd like the governance information to be clearer in what it's saying, to come through more clearly rather than have more of it. So that's one point I would make. The second point is we're looking, we're desperate really for, for good information on how green, and I use that word um, uh, uh, broadly, um, are different products and services. So I'd love to be able to see um, you know, a company in a particular sector, to what extent they're meeting different um, SDGs, sustainable development goals, through their products and services, how that's moved over time, how they compare against peers. Love to see more of that information. That's beginning to come, but, but we need that. The other thing which I'd really love to hand, have a handle on, what the impact of harassment, to what extent is the supply chain um, impacted by employee harassment? I'd love, to, I'd love to know more about that. I'd love to be able to look at in the round something I'm going to call value to society. So we've got the PL at the moment. We can see from the PL based on financial metrics, how much might be going to employees, how much might be going to the government uh, and the like. But then if we add in those external impacts, which are not internalized, it would give us an amazing picture of how well a company is performing relative to others in its sector and how it's performing relative to itself over time. So I'd love to see that. Now, data, 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 what you see on paper is what you see on paper. The data only really comes alive when you engage with the company. That's what we found. We can see two companies who look exactly the same on paper, but until you engage, you don't really get a feel for how well they might be performing in some of these areas. Jane. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's it. Very important. Um, I mean, Sarah O'Connor, who's been writing um, brilliantly on this for the mm. Financial Times, she actually says it's not just engaging with companies at the top; it's actually a bit of shoe leather. So you know, the boohoo could have easily been spotted if you'd actually gone to Leicester and spoken to one or two people in the pub. Um, so that, I think that's an issue. But actually, what this is spelling out to me from from what all of you are saying is, it's just there's a lot of work for fund managers uh, to do um, at a time when there's downward pressure on their charges, quite rightly. So actually, how, how is that circle squared in terms of um, all the work that's got to be done, both on, um, as Joni said, well, you don't, don't have to take my opinion, I can give you the raw data um, on the one hand, and also, as I said, it potentially perhaps shoe leather on the other. Well, that has to go back to Leon. I mean, your, your fees are under, under pressure? Um, so uh, fee fees are under pressure, but um, I would also say that um, whilst investment managers may be um, struggling a bit with their profitability over the last few years, it's still a very well-paid industry, both in terms of the profits we make and also as individuals in our, in our uh, uh, companies, um, we are well-paid relative to other, other industries. Um, I would... I would um, if we think about index investing and then active investing, I think there is investment to be made amongst the index investors to put more stewardship resource. Um, it is difficult to steward thousands and thousands of, of companies, mm. but it is something which index providers should, should, should be doing. And then in terms on the active side, I think on the active side, we, we need to move completely away from what, what is called benchmark hugging and um, have high active share funds which in which in the fund managers really know well the companies they've they've invested in and for that to be more high conviction investing and and in that high conviction in investing environment you can also apply active ownership or stewardship in in a more more effective way and you may well 
I mean, I've been to a, num a number of uh, factory floors um, uh, in order, the shoe leather. I mean, I still have my shoes through the pandemic are doing very well, but I have, I have lost a bit of shoe leather by going to see some of those factories, but you, you learn so much from doing so. For one um, service provider, we went to visit the prisons and prisons is, is one place where you can't really stage manage um, what you're showing your investors. It was incredibly eye-opening what we learned from, from doing that. So I think more, more of that is important. Catherine, um, fees, pressure on fees, is that going to, uh, to make, uh, are, there, are there going to be cuts in the ESG space because of the downward pressure on fees? Should there um, be? I hope not, because I'm a I'm a big fan, really, of downward pressure on fees. I think, um, you know, uh, with all due respect to the industry, it, it is an extraordinarily profitable and and as Leon has um, said, um, well paid um, industry. So there was there was quite a lot of um, fat that could be taken out before you start damage damaging the product um, and the quality of the product provided. And I think it's also you know, like in any competitive marketplace, um, consumer demand will will make a difference. So I think, you know, it, it won't be optional to to kind of say, oh, well, it was pressure on fees. We're going to ditch ESG because then you will not have a customer base, either institutional or retail, where this is becoming a, a lot more desirable and important. What I, what I think really matters is that customers, whether they're institutional or, or retail, actually get what they think they're buying because um there has you know there is an awful lot of marketing um in fact you know the spend on marketing in asset management is vastly higher than the spend on stewardship um which tells you sort of everything about some of the fat that <laughs> could be taken out of the system anyway I'm, I'm being a bit harsh there but i i do i do think that we we don't need to just we don't need to see a trade-off and shouldn't tolerate a trade-off between e and s i think we can't really tolerate a trade-off between being a responsible owner and really analysing all the factors that make for a company's success, and being a you know good value for money, um, and cutting um, some of what has been excessive um, ways of, of 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 running the businesses in in the investment sector. Okay, we are coming to the end, but let me give each of the three of you, and then Jane a final word, but each of the three of you, if you could just disaggregate E, S, and G, and give me, give us your thoughts on what's up, what's down over the, the medium term as we get out of the, uh, out of the COVID pandemic, what's going to be affected uh, most, and um, where, is the, where are the positive changes and where are the threats of negative change? First of all, Jonas. Yeah. Okay. I, to to be frank, I I only really look at E, and and you know, so some of my comments earlier about about data were really about E. So and I think Catherine made a very good point about you know data in S not being anywhere near that level. Um, so I'm only going to speak about E. And when it comes to that, uh, I would say that you know ambition is up, and I think we're seeing you know, new thresholds being breached. And I think that actually what we've now got is we've got a culture of competition around around e ambition and and subsequently around e performance that is that is starting to appear and you're seeing uh, you know i'm sort of seeing new industries getting infected by this competition uh, one after the other right you know the, the 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 topic of should you be responsible for scope 3 was a big issue in the oil industry only only a you know a couple of years ago and now it's pretty much accepted that you should be and everybody that isn't doing that is um you know is a pariah and we're seeing the same discussion play out in the steel industry now, and we'll see it in the mining industry, and we see, you know, and 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 that's how how, how it sort of rolls. So I I always think about this as a slippery slope, and I feel like the slope is only getting steeper, uh, and and more and more industries and companies are on it. Um, so, you know, every action and ambition may not be quite good enough right now, but everybody's headed in that direction because they can't stop anymore. And the pandemic is to that extent something that's um, not changing it greatly. I think it's accelerated it. Um, I, I think that um, I think that you know resiliency has come, become forefront of people's mind as a result of the pandemic. We've realized just how fragile our systems are, and everybody knows what the next big shock is. Everybody knows what you know what the next crisis is. There's one on the horizon that we've been ignoring for ages, 
And so, you know, from whether it's governments, whether it's investors, whether it's uh, whether it's companies in, in all different industries, everybody's realizing that this is something they're going to have to tackle now. Catherine, ES and G, the future. Well, I, I quite agree with Jonas that, that that the pandemic has, and it's really quite reassuring, um, only accelerated what were, what were already quite marked trends. So I think ES and G are all up, um, and 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 kind of bog standard market cap weighted investment funds that that haven't got a story and can't show value in this area are down. Having said that, the other thing that's up is um, if you'll excuse the language, you know, bullshit. We we really do need to be incredibly cautious about um, what products are really authentic in this area and which are not. So um, that's the kind of trickier watchword, I, I think, to go alongside what can only be celebrated as a really positive, strong, and I hope persistent trend in which investors and companies take serious account of, the, of their impacts and the risks to themselves of um, environmental and social uh, damage. Okay, so leave, leave governance aside, because I mean, I think Leon, Leon made a very strong point about the, the massive information in that area. The bullshit factor is greater in the environmental or in the social area? I think it's probably about the same but the just the the I, I, I don't have a view on whether it, it, it the problem is worse in in the s or the e but what, what is quite clearly the case is that the e is just a sort of ginormous um field of activity and the s is a sort of shrunken little um dwarf cousin uh, in comparison and we need to fix that leon um so in terms of the marketing factor, I, I remember when Catherine and I went to an industry conference up north once, um, I, was, I was staggered by the, the, the exhibition centre, how well resourced it was. And then when I went round, all I was offered was fantastic different types of coffee and lots of, lots of different bits, but no one could talk to me about their company, and that did concern me quite a lot. Um, so we have to be really, really careful from an investment point of view, investor uh, point of view and what we're offering, um, that greenwashing doesn't have its way. Um, the change which we have to collectively deliver has to be real and it has to be on the ground. And as investment managers, we have our role to play, to play in that. Um, so in terms of what's up and down, um, I think going forwards, it could go either way but it's in our collective hands. I think there is good momentum, as Jonas and, and Catherine has said. Um, there is positive momentum that we are going to try and address the climate disruption which we have coming. I have maybe more concerns, uh, no, I have equal concerns around the type of employment we're going to have in the future. Um, and because of that, I mean, in the inequality which may be increasing, um, fissures in society which are growing, the populism which, which is there could be really, really damaging. And companies and we as their stewards have a huge role to play in ensuring that there is a good level of employment and also quality employment uh, in the future. It's in our hands though. Let's be optimistic about what might happen. Final word, Jane, is with you. What do you take away from this? Um, well, confirmation that COVID's been a catalyst and is accelerating some of the trends. Um, but otherwise, I think um, the other encouraging thing, I think, is that um, we are getting um, not just more information, but better information uh, through some of the regulations on, on disclosures. But some things never change, which is the need for constant scrutiny of whether um, uh, words are being maxed matched by actions. Okay, on that mixed note, can I thank Leon Cammy? can I thank Catherine Howarth and Jonas Rusa, and of course my colleague Jane Fuller and you for watching. Many thanks to all of you.